Bill's novel, 1984, like the Bible, Pilgrim's Progress, uh, Hamlet, uh, gradually became part of the collective subconscious of the human race. And as time passed since the writing of it in 1948, his novel, 1984, its imagery, its language, has seeped into our bones, into our thoughts, dreams, nightmares, into speech itself. Orwellian evokes a cataclysmic, nightmarish vision, and Big Brother has countless entries on the, on the web. Uh, to retell the stories in opera, however, to remain faithful to Orwell's story, while stripping from it all untheatrical elements, proved to be a formidable task indeed. And then to find sounds that would flesh out its emotional overtones and undercurrents pose a challenge awesome in every way. And these sounds would have to evoke a world frozen in time in the late 50s, uh, let's say, to become rigid cultural artifacts in an imaginary world that Orwell, of course, called 1984. An opera can only function theatrically that is focused on individuals brought forth as personages with the passions, frailties, and yearnings of human beings. And, of course, we must know about their loves. And in Winston and Julia, we have uh, an anti-hero and an anti-heroine, and they are the lovers of 1984. Winston is an almost 40-year-old apparatchik, and uh, Julia, a 23-year-old uh, cheerleader. Winston is a stubborn non-believer in Big Brother. Let's not forget that a thought crime and not to believe in Big Brother is a thought crime. In the world of 1984, it's punishable by torture and death. Now, Julia sleeps around with highly placed party members who she thinks might help her out of trouble if she ever gets into it. And she's had rebellious thoughts, too. And Julia spies Winston working in the office of the Ministry of Truth, thinks he's worth a trick, but then falls in love uh, with him, as eventually he does uh, with her. And let's not forget also that love is a crime punishable by torture and death in the world of 1984. Now, Winston and Julia have their clandestine uh, love affair uh, in the full knowledge that someday they'll be discovered and arrested and, of course, tortured and killed. When they are arrested, it is only then we begin to grasp the horrors of the world in which they, and by implication, billions of others actually live. Here are two people with whom we have identified lovers we can love. And when they suffer torture, humiliation, degradation, we grasp what it means to each individual to be in the fatal grip of an all-powerful dictatorship. The world of today already shows very clear signs of an ever-diminishing freedom of the individual, of the ever-so-gradual encroachment in the lives of all of us of big brotherism. Scores of Orwell's predictions uh, have already come true. The opera 1984 tells Orwell's story as it was written. It is a stark, brutal story of oppression which offers no hope at its end. We would like to think that everyone attending our opera will resolve the very next day to do whatever is necessary to prevent our world from going the same way. The opera begins with a hate chant. We see the mob, uh, see and hear them, in its most primitive form. They scream, let rivers of blood overwhelm them, rip out their guts, poke out their eyes, tear out their hearts. Now, 
Dictators could never come to power and hold it were it not for the violence inherent in the crowd mentality. The need to prostrate oneself before a higher force has also always been neatly exploited and cynically manipulated by those who seek power. The national anthem of Oceania, the realm of Big Brother, follows on the heels of the religious chant. Now all national anthems have one thing in common, a platitudinous text and immensely banal music. But here I was not ten minutes into the opera and there already seven clearly recognizable music icons or leitmotifs. We have another light motif from uh, the religious chant, Big Brother, the Guardian of Truth. Big Brother of the Guardian of Truth. I don't care, I don't care, I We first uh, encounter the heroine Julia when she walks into the office with some papers for Winston, who's working in the Ministry of Truth, and she calls out uh, 6079 Smith W. And at that moment, we first hear the leitmotif of Julia, Julia herself. Six oh seven nine Smith. Six O seven nine Smith W. Yes, you are the new girl. Times nine month mini plenty mal bolted chocolate rectify persons. Now we meet some of the office characters, the people who work with. Winston in the Ministry of Truth. There's Parsons. Um, he's a kind of uh, woolly-headed fellow, uh, a real apparatchik, someone who believes in the part party uh, dumbly and without questioning. And he has a very comical song called With Our Quotas Far Exceeded. With our quotas far exceeded There's nothing else that's needed The facts are better than not switched Chocolate never been so rich. And then there's uh, like Syme. Well, he's the office pedant. Uh, it's his job to rewrite uh, language, to reduce it to its absolute minimum. And he sings like um, the opposite of good is not bad, it's ungood. Okay? And he has this kind of rap tune uh, music accompanying all his double talk. You speak 
That's the new language, okay? It won't be English anymore. It's going to be called You Speak. Enter a rather ambiguous and threatening figure, an inner party member by the name of O'Brien. He says to Winston, uh, the hate rally today, did I note a certain lack of enthusiasm? The mind, when it wanders, is useless. The mind, when it hesitates, is dangerous. The mind, when it thinks, well, sees, we find. Later we find Winston in the privacy of his own room uh, about to write in his newly acquired diary an, an act punishable by death in the world of 1984. He swigs down victory gin as he writes, uh, from the age of double thing, greeting, and falls asleep. Uh, he is awakened um, by the gym instructress who enters on the interactive telescreen. Um, the gym instructress spots Winston, who isn't touching his toes as he stretches down. You can do better. And at a certain point, uh, we don't hear a sound from her, even though she's pretending to sing. And at that moment, you no longer hear anything coming from the orchestra pit. The conductor continues to conduct because uh, upon the screen, we uh, see an announcement coming from the office of Big Brother. And as in airplanes today, when you're watching a movie, if the captain has something to say, the movie is stopped in its tracks. And so uh, this uh, announcement stops us right in our tracks. And it's an effect, I think, that has uh, up until now never been seen in the, uh, uh, in the opera house. <laughs> Ministry of Truth has issued an announcement. Today's two-minute hate will commence in Victory Square at precisely 13 o'clock. The Ministry of Love has also issued an announcement. All citizens are to remain in Victory Square after the two-minute hate for a rally of the Anti-Sex League. The Ministry of Peace is pleased to announce that the war against the Eurasian hordes continues to move rapidly from victory to victory. The end is now in sight. Return to your duties. Um, then we have uh, pro children singing traditional ditties like uh, London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. And there was once an old woman called Nothing at All. And Julia appears as a cheerleader of uh, the Anti Sex League uh, women's chorus. And, of course, they sing, uh, we pledge our lives to chastity. We pledge our lives to chastity, our hearts to spotless purity, our pleasure we could live, we serve the prince of this purity, purity, Proles, um, they, they're just plain folk, okay, ignored by Big Brother as being essentially irrelevant, i.e. too downtrodden, dumb, and sullen to be worth bothering with. At a certain point, we see a group of prisoners being marched across the square. The crowd comes to life, lynches one, springs him up, and drools at the face, uh, turning blue as he twists and twitches. Uh, their pleasure is interrupted by the unmistakable sound of an incoming rocket bomb. The crowd scurries away in fright. And when the smoke clears, we see Winston lying on the ground, slightly injured, 
And we hear from the orchestra the strains of the pub quartet, It Was Only an Opeless Fonce, as we gaze upon the dangling corpse. And so ends Act One. <laughs> Act two begins in the antique shop where Winston had bought his diary. And the proprietor, Charrington, a sweet old man, reminisces with Winston about old London, as it was once called, now called Airstrip One. tomorrow night and then gives the place of a possible uh, trysting area. I love you. Well, they do meet at the trysting place. They try to have sex right away. It doesn't work. Winston draws away saying, but I know nothing about you. And this is when we find out who Julia really is. She sings a very long aria, about six minutes, entitled you hide what you have to, revealing who she really is. Well, they uh, begin to approach one another, feeling more comfortable at this point. But Julia clouds over singing, We are the dead, the dead, the dead. Another leitmotif of the opera. We are all dead. Finally about to make love, to sing their love duet. It goes like this. Brian walks into their hiding place and commands them to meet with him the next day at his apartment. Well, the meeting there is a very creepy affair. 
twelve tone music drones on and on, always in the same relentless pattern. O'Brien invites lovers to become part of an anti-Big Brother conspiracy. The lovers, Winston and Julia, agree. The next scene finds them in their new love nest at the antique shop, second floor. Love music fills the air. Their afternoon is not sweet and prolonged, for Charrington bursts into the room, now revealing himself as an officer of the Thought Police. A SWAT team crashes through the window. The lovers are arrested. Julia is hauled up by rope to a hovering helicopter. And so ends Act Two. Three is set in a prison. Winston, Parsons, Syme have all been arrested. They await torture and death. Suddenly thrown into their midst is a drunken woman, a prostitute. Bastards! They don't know how to treat a lady. Parsons is dragged into room 101, the most feared place in the world. Soon Winston is also thrown into room 101, the to be tortured by O'Brien, yes, O'Brien, who, like Charrington, is also a member of the Thought Police. Winston's spirit is almost broken. He's told that Julia was tortured and had capitulated right away. O'Brien shows a video to Winston of her being tortured. Winston's left to hallucinate as he writhes on the ground in pain and horror. He dreams of Julia. He dreams of his mother. And he's then brought back to be tortured yet again. But why? What does O'Brien want? 
When Winston is confronted with the prospect of being eaten alive by rats, he suddenly realized what was required of him. Do it to Julia, not me. Julia, he screams as the rats approach him. His love was to be shattered. That was the point of his torture. His spirit was to be broken and his brain washed out of any trace of humanity. The last scene finds Winston running into Julia at the Chestnut Tree Cafe. A blues singer is heard singing in the blues style of the 50s and 60s. Remember when you thought it would never end. She also sings, Why Am I Always Yearning? And Julia says to Winston, maybe we'll meet again. And Winston says, yeah, maybe. She leaves. The brainwashed Winston sings to the portrait of Big Brother. I love Big Brother, Brother, Big Brother. I love Big Brother. same music he sang in the first act when it was I hate Big Brother. Well, at this point we hear snippets of the national anthem, snippets taken from the pro woman's song, Stars Still Hang in the Sky. And then the opera ends as it begins when the curtain opens with 13 peals of Big Ben.